When I was a kid, I learned three things about being Hmong. The first was Hmong yo chi lu Hmong, yo Hmong chi lu Hmong, ling de yo lu Hmong, which translates to Hmong people have to love each other. If we don't love each other, who will love us? The second thing I learned was that if you're Hmong and you're traveling anywhere in the world, you can randomly look up any Hmong person by last name, call them up, and they will offer you a place to stay, food to eat. This is Hmong hospitality. The third thing I learned was that we don't let our elders die in nursing homes. They live with us until they pass on. Then we take care of their burial services. At the end of the day, what I really learned was that, in the Hmong community, we take care of each other, no matter what. On June 10, 2013, inside the city of Altoona, a town just a few miles from Eau Claire, Wisconsin, Panyevu died, though no one would know it for several days. Shua Hmong TV, a Hmong news station, interviewed this man, Na Ba Vu, who identified himself as Pinyin's brother. Mr. Vu described how his sister was strangled in this bedroom by her husband. Meanwhile, in the comments beneath the video, other people weighed in on Pinyin's death. And as Mr. Vu showed the news reporter where the perpetrator attempted to bury Pinyin's body, more comments. They wanted the mainstream news sites to verify the situation. They got it. Ying Shang, a 41 year old man, was arrested after a high speed car chase with police officers. They found $19,000 in cash on him. Meanwhile, the press described Panya as woman, sometimes girlfriend, sometimes cultural wife. This would become an important detail later. In reality, Panya Vu was a 35 year old Hmong woman. She had six children, including a five month old daughter. In spite of marrying young, she went on to get a bachelor's degree in counseling as well as a master's and doctorate degree in clinical psychology. When the coroner's office released Panya's body on July 12th, one month after she was found, no one claimed it. This is Mao Kang, a domestic violence advocate at the Women's Center in Wasa, Wisconsin. On July 13th, a candlelight vigil was held, but some community members thought this was insufficient. Funerals are important. Beyond being a basic dignity for every being, Hmong people believe that during the funeral process, we are guided back to the place where we were born. Traditionally, Hmong people believe that women and their souls belong to their father's home. If a woman marries, she and her soul become a part of that new family. Panyevu's case is complicated because she had multiple marriages. When she married her first husband, she and her soul belonged to that clan. When she divorced him, she and her soul were in limbo, not quite belonging anywhere. According to this belief, Hmong men's bodies and souls are never in limbo. Whether they marry or divorce, the clan into which they are born will always take care of them. In 2012, Panya remarried Ying Shang, which meant her body and soul were now connected to the Shang clan. It also meant that the Shang clan was responsible for her and her children. But Ying Shang claimed they had already divorced. Because most Hmong weddings and divorces do not include paperwork, no one could dispute this. 
While Pena's body waited to be buried, the 18 Clan Council of Wisconsin was called in to mediate, primarily to hold the Shawn Clan accountable. In the end, community organizations, including Eau Claire Bolton Refuge, the Women's Center, Citizens Against Domestic Violence, and Silence of Hmong Village, came together to host a ceremony. The event included speeches by community activists, domestic violence survivors, and even Pania's children. Two months after she was killed, Pania's body was finally laid to rest, not by the clans she was associated with, but by community organizations and people. Strangers. I thought Pena's case was unique, but I learned she was not the first Hmong woman to have her funeral presided by strangers. It was just the most high profile one to date. In December 2013, Ying Shang was sentenced to 22 and a half years of prison. In St. Paul, Minnesota, a Mecca for the Hmong, Hmong people like to use black granite headstones like these. They rise unapologetically out of the earth. But when I went through the Forest Hill Cemetery where Pania was buried, there were very few black granite headstones, and the few that existed did not belong to Hmong people. Finally, I looked online and saw that Pania did not get a headstone, but a grave marker, a small slab of stone that was easy to miss. I've often seen these stones on the graves of people who have died a long time ago, or on the graves of small children, or on the graves of people who die anonymously. This project is supported in part by the National Endowment for the Arts, on the web at arts.gov. You know, I've thought about how to explore this project through poetry. I've thought about how to explore it through theater. And then I realized I don't have to really make up anything because the story is so compelling. Um, I, I think I need to do a documentary project because I need the people who are involved to just tell their own truth. Uh, my name is Mei Li Yang and I am a writer in the Twin Cities, so mostly known as a playwright, but I also write poetry, among other things. Storytelling is a really important art form because I uh, grew up in a culture where um, there weren't a lot of Hmong writers, right? And so for me, to be able to tell our, our own stories in our own words is incredibly important. But one of the reasons why I decided to join the Docu program was because I've been struggling with the project that I'm, which I'm calling the Dead Hmong Women Project, which explores domestic violence within the Hmong community. When I started this project, I thought, you know, um, I usually write or, or do work around issues that are related to me directly. And so I thought, I'm not a domestic violence survivor. I don't work in advocacy. Do I have a right to be a part of this project? To be honest, I actually don't think this project is really for women who've gone through abuse because they've lived that. That's their truth, right? I really am interested in targeting people who are, like myself, are bystanders.